All right. Well, good day, everyone. Um, as always, thank you for joining the Garden Hour with MU Extension. We're always happy to have you all in from across the state and have our horticulturists working on answering your questions and bringing timely topics to you for the gardening season. Um, just to let you know, we, we do have uh, horticulturists across the state and so if you haven't seen this map before, you know, take a look there, see what county you're in and go ahead and uh, take a moment to jot down the email of, of your, the person in your county. If you do happen to be in any of the counties that have an open position, um, just feel free to reach out to one of your neighboring horticulturists. Um, they're always help, happy to help answer any of your gardening questions, help you interpret soil test reports, um or, or anything of that like um so today we are without our favorite weatherman pat ganan so we we won't be having a weather report today um so i'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our moderator for today donna offenberg thank you justin um so uh we have several great topics today a big diverse selection of topics and the first topic we have is about daughter in the yard and garden. Um, and I will let Justin take back over for this one topic. All right, thanks, Donna. Just a moment here. All right, so <clears throat> daughter. Um, so this might be a new uh, plant to folks. Um, a lot of folks have not heard of dotter. So I was been cutting grass the past couple um, weekends. And about a month ago, I noticed this stuff and I, I recognized it because I, I had attended a conference where they were talking about dotter control um, and vegetable, vegetable production. So I knew right away what it was. Um, I didn't really know how to control it. This is a picture um, from my yard. Um, obviously, the not not the most well managed patch of turf here. Um, we got some clover and some some lespedeza there, but I, I knew right away what it was. I didn't really have the time time to look up control options, and I just thought, well, maybe if I just mow it short enough, you know, maybe that'll work. And so apparently, that didn't work because after about a month. Um, this stuff had spread into a, a lot bigger patch. So um, this is probably a little bit more common in rural areas than it is in urban areas. But I wanted to talk about this because I think it's a pretty interesting plant. So dotter is a common name used to describe uh, several different species of parasitic plants. Um, and if you haven't heard of parasitic plants before, it's it's pretty interesting. This is what's known as an obligate parasite, which it means it it cannot complete its life cycle without a host. So um, some parasites are not obligate and they can they can complete their life cycle without a host, but that's not the case for daughter. So this is an annual plant. Um, and interestingly, it lacks roots, leaves, and chlorophyll. Um, you could see from that first picture, it's got these, these slender yellow orange stems. It looks kind of like spaghetti or like a thin string trimming line. So the stem will cover uh, host plants pretty effectively. It'll wrap itself around host plants and form this kind of spaghetti-like mat. Um, it does flower in summer and early fall. <clears throat> Once the seeds germinate and it's attached to the host, uh, the, bottom of, the bottom of that daughter plant actually dies and it severs its connection with the soil. And at that point, that daughter becomes solely dependent on that host plant for water and nutrients. So the picture on the left is one that I took um, of a blade of grass that really got tangled up in this daughter. If we look at the picture in the middle, that would be like a cross section of a stem. Um, and you can see the yellow daughter wrapping around. And if you look closely enough, there's these little structures that are actually inserting themselves into the, the stem of this plant here. Um, and on the far right, that's what it looks like under a microscope. So these little structures that penetrate uh, the tissue of the host plant are known as historia. And so they penetrate that tissue, they extract water um, and nutrients from the host plants. And interestingly enough, they also aid in plant communication. So when I was looking some stuff up on daughter, 
there's actually some studies. So, you know, if one plant uh, has daughter around it and that same daughter stem is around another plant, if a plant gets attacked by insects, um, you know, it will, it will naturally produce compounds to help fight against insect herbivory. Um, and those compounds are actually transported through the daughter. And so uh, kind of interesting that plants are actually able to communicate through this, through this connection. I, I guess communication is, um, you know, we put that in parentheses because they're not necessarily talking to each other, but there is some, some chemical transmission that goes on um, through this daughter to other plants. So the picture on the left is what the, the flowers and immature seeds look like. <clears throat> the picture on the right um, is what the mature seeds look like. This picture wasn't great because I had a big pile of this seed and it was blowing back into my yard as I was trying to take this picture. Um, you can see on the bottom right, um, there's a little orange um, particle there. And it, when I cracked these open, it looked kind of like a hulled hemp seed if you've ever eaten hemp seeds. Um, but the problem with these guys is they can remain dormant for for many years and really survive up to 20 years in the soil. So um, if you have daughter in your yard or in your garden, it's something that you want to control pretty aggressively. So in terms of control, you know, it's best to start as early as possible. So if you see this stuff, go ahead and get a move on it. And it can be manually removed, um, but you want to take time to remove all the stems and stem pieces um, from the garden. Um, and if it's strongly attached to a plant, you want to make sure to remove that host plant as well, not just the string that's on top. And even the severed stems, the little, you know, fragments of stems, if they are in contact with the, with the host plant after you're removing it, they are still capable of reattaching to that host plant and growing and producing flowers and seeds. So um, there are some control options. There's not a lot of great information about controlling this in home lawns, but um, there have been some reports that glyphosate is effective. That's a non-selective herbicide, so it is going to kill anything that it contacts. Um, there have been sort of some reports of T 2,4-D being effective at daughter control. 2,4-D is a broadleaf weed killer, so it is more selective. Both of those are for post-emergence control. There are uh, also products with trifluralin. Those can work for pre-emergence control. So if you have a big patch of this and it's already went to seed um, and you want to try to control pre-emergence, you could apply um, trifluralin for pre-emergence control. And so, you know, best to control this before that mature seed is set, because once that mature seed is set and dispersed, you could be dealing with this for quite some time. And that is all I got about daughter. Okay, Justin, thank you. Very fascinating information. Um, I know I've already seen it in my area and several places, so this will be very useful information. So our next uh, topic we have is horticulture terminology. And uh, Debbie, you want to take that? Oh, yes. So while I'm pulling up my PowerPoint, how about um, there was a question that came in the chat box. Can plants other than grass serve as a host plant for daughter? Um, yes. Um, there's, there's many species of daughter, and it can be really hard to identify what species, um, but yes, there are, there are many different host plants that daughter can survive on. All right, so we have our horticulture terminology for today. The term is dioecious. And so you select, and uh, Jared, if you could put the poll up for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, is dioecious, does that mean it's a plant with only one male flower, only male flowers on that plant? Is it a plant with only female flowers on that plant? Or is it a plant that has separate male and female flowers, but they're on the same plant? So let's see what kind of answers we're gonna get here. Wow, this is interesting. I don't know if you can see it as it's, if it's, as it's moving along. We got about half of you on there. Anybody else wanna try to answer? All right, I'm about ready to close it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. 
So the results are showing that 95% of you say that it's C. And I have to tell you, you guys are really, really smart because the answer is dioecious means male flowers and female flowers are on separate plants. And so looking a little bit at Latin because Latin has a lot to do with our horticulture terms and terminology and naming of our plants. So di means two in Latin. Mono in Latin means one. So a monoecious is male flowers and female flowers are on the same plant. And hermaphroditic is male flowers and female parts are in the same flower on the same plant. And it's known as a perfect flower. So you have a flower, one flower, it has the male and the female on it in the same flower. And that's a perfect flower. Imperfect means that it doesn't have the male or it doesn't have the female on that same flower. So they're separate with different flowers themselves. So it's really interesting how our plants are and how they all come together and how uh, we just kind of learn from each other. So dioecious, uh, you need both a male. If it's a dioecious plant, it means that you need to have both male and female plants in order for the female to be a female plant to be able to set the fruit or to make seed. Only about 5% of plants are actually considered dioecious. Examples include holly. So around Christmas time, we always see a holly bush. So if you see a bush that's out there and it's got the red berries on it, it's going to be a female plant. If you see a holly and it has no berries on it when it should at the time of year have, bolly, have berries on it, then you know it's probably a male plant. Um, ginkgo, which is a tree that we have around here, spinach, that was new to me. I didn't realize that, but then we eat the spinach hopefully before it bolts and goes to seed. Pussy willow, didn't realize that one either. White ash, juniper. We had junipers when I was a kid growing up, and so I noticed that some of those would have those little blueberries and others wouldn't. Asparagus, and I did know that one, and then yews also are considered dioecious, where you can actually see the male and the female uh, plant itself. So when you go to the store or a nursery to buy a plant, you don't know if it's going to, if it's a, unless you know it's dioecious, you don't know if you're buying a male or a female plant because they don't mark it as such. So a lot of times you just got to make sure that you buy a couple of them and hope to get a male and a female so that you can uh, see and reap the benefits of the fruit and the seeds if that's why you're buying the plants. That's all that I have on uh, our horticulture terminology for today. Thank you, Debbie. So of course, since we're in the fall of the year and a lot of us are starting to um, grow fall plants, we need to start talking about fall cabbage, um, call, um, fall cabbage worms or any pests that might affect um, anything in the brassica family. And so Eli is going to take this topic. <clears throat> All right, great. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, thanks for that uh, interesting information about the dioecious plants. I had no idea that the white ash was also dioecious. Um, it seems like just yesterday, but it must have been sometime close to a month and a half ago, I was talking about uh, how it's not too late to plant your uh, some vegetables for the fall. And so hopefully some of you guys got out there and got some fall brassicas put out there, some kale or cabbage, uh, whatever it might be. I know that's one of my favorite vegetables to eat in the fall, but unfortunately, um, we do have some pests that come along with that. Um, I'm here in uh, St. Louis, and uh, things have started to cool off a bit. We've had a couple of weeks of cool weather, uh, so you can get warm again, but we've had a couple of weeks of cool weather, so these brassicas are doing good with some irrigation. So the uh, first one we're going to look at is the imported cabbage worm. So this is the moth of it. It has these, uh, these uh, spots on the back. And then um, you can see this, uh, um, excuse me, you can see this uh, narrow orange stripe down the middle of the back of the larva and along each side of the body. And so this, you can see the damage caused. Um, the damage is uh, similar to a cabbage looper injury, um, but they don't limit themselves to uh, areas between the leaf veins, but chew through the leaves uh, indiscriminately. Um, Thankfully, uh, control of the imported cabbage worm can be accomplished using a variety of products, BT, spinosad, pyrethrins, and uh, 
uh, luckily you can use a product as a benign to humans as a BT bacillus thuringiensis. Um, and when you wanna spray the BT, you're gonna wanna spray it earlier or late in the day and make at least two applications with two to three day intervals between them. Um, <laughs> the eggs of the imported cabbage worm are yellow, oblong, and bluntly pointed at the ends. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to start scouting for these pests now. Um, then we have the cabbage looper. Uh, the cabbage looper um, walks with a gait that gives it the name because it looks like a loop when it walks. Um, the eggs are uh, singly and mainly on the lower surfaces of the outer leaves, and they're also greenish. Um, here, that's the it's not the moth that does the damage for either the loop or the imported cabbage worm, but it is the larval stage, the caterpillar. And um, they also feed on the underside of leaves where they'll move to the center of the plant. Um, this not only makes your uh, product, your vegetable unsightly, but um, can uh, cause it so you don't even want to eat it. Um, thankfully, the cabbage looper um, can be controlled uh, similarly to the imported cabbage worm with BT spinosets of pyrethrins. Um, I would suggest using the BT. Um, now this isn't a fully exhaustive list of all the pests you can have on your brassicas or your cabbages, but um, just a short, uh, you know, greatest hits. And the final one are uh, aphids or cabbage. There's cabbage aphids, turnip aphids. That's what these pictures are. Um, here on the turnip aphids, you can see some of them are swollen. They've actually been parasitized by a parasitic wasp called aphiditis, aphidus, aphidius colimani. And so it'll actually, it's swollen up and the wasp is pupating in there and it'll emerge out. All the eggs will pupate and emerge out. Um, so the aphids, they'll attack the coal crops. They really like this uh, cool dry weather we're having right now. And um, definitely it's something you can see when plants are stressed, you'll see aphids. Um, and they will... Uh, They'll suck the sap out of the plant, out of the leaves, and the affected plants are dwarfed. They grow slowly, and they won't produce. If you're growing cabbage, it won't produce a head. It won't head up for you. Um, and so since we're talking about vegetable gardens, you're going to want to spray the foliage with soapy water and then rinse it with clear water if you want to go totally with no insecticides, or you could use an insecticidal soap. Um, it's also found that neem oil is well effective in working on aphids and cabbages. Uh, there's a few other pests, but these are the big ones to keep an eye out for. And that's what I have on uh, cabbage and brassica pests in the fall. Okay. So Eli, while you're still up, um, how about uh, talking to us about how to take a soil test? I'd be happy to do that. Let me get it set up. Yeah. Okay. All right, so taking a soil sample. Um, this is a, a really, you know, soil sampling is a really powerful tool that you have available to you um, in Missouri and in any state in the United States that uh, has a land grant university, which they all do, and they most all of them have a soil sampling lab. Um, here in this uh, overview slide, you can see a couple of ways to take it. You don't actually need to go out and purchase a soil probe or borrow a soil probe to take a sample. You can certainly do it with a shovel. Um, the soil probe just uh, speeds it up for taking a lot of samples. Um, all right, so why would you want a soil test? Now, uh, first of all, you wanna check the nutrient status of your soil. Maybe you've seen some problems in what you're growing and uh, you wanna try and figure out why. And, the phenotypic results in your vegetables or flowers, you haven't been able to sort out if you have a nutrient imbalance. Um, maybe it's not even a nutrient imbalance, but it's your soil pH is off. Maybe, you know, the classic example of maybe trying to go grow blueberries and your pH is too high, or um, maybe you've been renovating a garden and you need to find out if your pH has changed or maybe just wanna check on how well you've been doing with uh, keeping up with your soil fertility program. Um, the soil test will uh, give you recommendations so you know what to apply to support plant health and vigor. Um, we're really uh, lucky here that our soil testing service does a really good job. You can receive fertility and pH adjustment recommendations for specific plantings. 
Um, and then uh, the other good thing is you can minimize minimize your environmental impacts. This is something I see a lot with uh, <laughs> soil tests for lawn in the St. Louis area and places where lawns have been maintained. Um, there's ends up being a lot of excess in phosphorus and potassium. And without taking a soil test, you may not know that you don't have, that you have an excess and you may continue to apply these nutrients and these nutrients can then run off because um, they won't be fixed by the soil and be available to the plant because they're already in excess. Um, so the sampling procedure, um, you want to take eight to 12 subsamples over your area. You're going to sample only from zero to six inches. Um, that's where the majority of the roots are for your garden plants. Like I said before, you can use a soil probe or you can use a shovel or a trowel and you want to put them into a clean bucket. Um, it's really important to make sure, um, like if you're for some reason you're sampling for heavy metals, you don't want to use a bucket that you've been using to change oil with because um, that'll throw up your heavy metal testing. Or if you have something else in your bucket, if you were just, uh, I don't know, if you were uh, just using phosphoric acid for some reason and you have residues of that in your bucket, so you can throw things off. So you wanna make sure you use a, a clean bucket. Um, you wanna sample problem uh, your problem area separately. This is an issue run into a lot where I get a soil sample and I get the result. And um, I talk to the, the person who submitted the sample and said, I have a problem with this area and everything looks to be fine on the sample results. Um, but I don't have any way to compare it to something that's doing well that's in the same soil. Maybe there's something that I'm not seeing. Um, so after you uh, get your, you take your your little bit of soil and you put it into your bucket, you're going to want to pull your grass or leaves or whatever is on the surface. Take that out. You're going to mix your uh, samples together uh, to make two cups for the sample. Maybe you'll have three or four cups after you've mixed it. And you'll air dry your soil for a while and then you'll actually when you send it you'll send them two cups of soil and uh, it, I would I would suggest and recommend a generous two cups of soil um, it's better for them to have more than less um, uh, in addition so if you want a soil test for your lawn uh, people like to manage their lawns very intensively and um, your garden, you need to take two different samples or even your flower bed or whatever it may be because they're being different. Plants are growing and they're usually being managed differently. Um, if you are, uh, for some reason, you have an intersection of two different soil types in your yard or garden, you're gonna wanna sample those differently because they may have different physical properties that will relate to their nutrient holding capacity. Um, so you wanna send those in separately. And the really important thing is to uh, label your samples with the label that you know what it means and then draw a map of your yard or garden with those sample names labeled. Um, it won't do you much good if you don't know, if you can't correspond your results back to where it is in your garden or yard. Um, so you're taking your soil sample, you dried it out, you have two cups, what are you gonna do? I'm, I'm really uh, happy you made it this far. You're doing a great job. You can just go ahead and bring that into your local extension office. You bring a check to pay them, that'll work well. Some of them can take a credit card. You'll be asked a, a series of questions to fill in the appropriate form. There's a yard form, there's a commercial fruit and vegetable, there's a yard garden form, commercial fruit and vegetable, and there's a commercial horticulture form. There's also an agronomy form. Um, and uh, you and the um, Extension personnel will figure out the correct form to use for your application and uh, you'll fill it out. Or if uh, for one reason or another, you don't wanna go into the extension office, you can mail your sample directly to the soil testing lab. Um, you'll go ahead and fill out the paperwork I just mentioned. You'll pack your own sample and use your preferred service to send the sample to the lab. Um, there's instructions for doing all of that online. Don't forget when you send your sample in to send in your method of payment. So you sent your sample in, you're doing great. Now what? Um, so your results, they're usually, right now things are turning around in less than two weeks, so you'll get your results back. And then the field specialist that's covering your county will also get a copy of the results. Um, the results are pretty easy to understand. There's, there's some, you know, the nutrient levels may be difficult to understand if you're a bit of a novice, but if you uh, scroll down in the page, you will find a, box with bullet points and that will actually 
give you uh, written directions on what you need to do to take care of your soil to improve it if it needs improvement. Um, also right above there, there's some information about how much of each nutrient or lime or sulfur you may need to apply. And if you have difficulty understanding the form, um, there's online resources for interpretation. And um, I also put links to all this information in the chat so you can check it out. Um, yeah, that's how to, how to take a soil sample. It's really valuable this time of year to take one for your fall yard. Um, figure out if you want to do any liming in the garden too over the winter time, get ready for the spring. And it's a, it's a great service uh, that we have that you can really take advantage of to have uh, the best garden you can have. All right, that's what I have for uh, how to take a soil sample. Okay, thank you, Eli. Um, so the next topic is selecting fall bulbs. And that is actually my topic. So let me get my screen pulled up here. Um, Okay, so for some odd reason, it is not working. Just one moment. All right, I think I got it now. All right, so um, this time of year, as fall is approaching, a lot of us are starting to think about um, planting bulbs that would uh, come out in the spring. And so we decided that maybe we should talk about how to select those bulbs. Uh, you're not going to be planting them yet, but you need to start thinking about selection if you already haven't. So um, when we talk about uh, fall planting for spring flowering bulbs, these are the bulbs that we're talking about. So it's anywhere between, you know, uh, from tulips and hyacinths, uh, daffodils, uh, tulips, alliums, all of these uh, that are pictured here are considered um, fall planted and spring blooming bulbs. And so that's that's what we're going to talk about. So the big thing about when you want to select any of these is you want to do your homework. There are scads and scads of companies out there. There's lots of different bulbs, lots of different varieties. Um, you know, you can, you can get simple ones, you can get fancy ones. So lots of selection out there. Um, the big thing is do your homework. Um, I know when I flip through those beautiful catalogs, you start having to look at the zones, or at least I try to pay attention to the zones, because we cannot grow anything normally, or it won't overwinter if we get into seven, eight, nine, or 10. So you got to really watch that. Um, most of Missouri is in six or five. And so you can grow six below, you know, six and below in my area up north, maybe in Kirksville, you might be able to do five and below. So pay attention to those zones. Um, pay attention to plant placement, whether it's going to be sun or shade where you're wanting to put these. Think about the soil type. Most of these bulbs are a fleshy bulb. Um, and so they do not do well in heavy moisture soils or heavy clay soils. And, and so think about an area that needs to be well-drained. Um, think about the plant traits that you want out of these bulbs, um, tall, short, color, um, whether it's going to make a big impact or it's going to be small. Um, think about that bulb source. I know I just mentioned it, but sources do matter. Um, there, are, uh, there are companies out there that are well known for providing very good bulbs. And there's others that are known for producing poor bulbs. So do your homework. And you can also get bulbs locally, but I would find out where they're getting them from, how long they've been sitting there, so on and so forth. Uh, big thing is select only healthy bulbs. Of course, when you're ordering online, how do you know they're healthy? You won't know until they come in. And so think about also how much you want to spend because some of these bulbs can get pretty um, expensive. Uh, for example, on the alliums, the bigger the allium ball, and that's the allium is pictured on this slide, you can get a three to five inch ball um, in diameter 
and they're going to run you two fifty to five dollars a piece, just depending on the variety. So you can have a lot of money invested in some. Others will be pretty cheap. You might uh, pay twenty cents, fifty cents, up to a dollar on some of them. So that's why I'm saying shop around, take a look around, um, take a look at some of the catalogs. Uh, the other thing is when you're picking these bulbs, think about one, where you're going to put them and think about that color color combination that you want. Um, I know that some people like the red and yellow combination or the purple and yellow combination. Um, and so when you um, go looking at these catalogs or websites, think about those colors and think about what's opposite or complementary. Um, there are lots of bulb mixes that you can already get pre-selected on colors and, and it's an easy uh, purchase and easy planting. Um, and then of course, think about what you already have in your yard, what those uh, colors are in the spring in certain beds. You might want to add com complementary colors um, in existing landscapes. Um, and then the other thing is some of these bulb, uh, the bulb foliage gets pretty ugly after the bloom. So there are bulbs out there that you can buy with fancier foliage so that you don't have to disguise or distract to try to take away from that ugly foliage. Consider um, the design um, elements. You want to, um, once again, plant among existing landscape beds. So perennial, uh, you want to plant into perennial shrubs um, and trees. And that way you have a longer, more diverse time of bloom in the spring. Uh, think always power in masses. So you want to plant more than 12 bulbs. I know I've always been bad about putting a, a tulip here and then a tulip in another bed and a tulip in the backyard. No, you want to do 12 or more. That way you get that pow factor that that you want that power in masses and be selective because if you go to hog wild, like I've been known to do, you want this and that and this and that and you get a little bit of each one and then you've just got a, a, a huge menagerie of colors and it's just, it's just a little distracting. And so if you can, you know, plant in masses for the power, but be selective on and, and make fewer variety choices, you can actually have more impact. Uh, one thing with tulips that I found very beneficial is you want to plant early, mid, and late blooming tulips to extend that bloom time. And so you, you will start very early in the spring and you can maximize your tulip blooming time by anywhere between six to 12 weeks, just based on what you're putting in. And my recommendation is go always go with the perennial tulips or what we call the Darwin tulips because you have a greater um, odds for them coming back unless um, critters get them. And that's that's one thing uh, we always try to encourage people to cage them or plant them in a style that that they won't be as apt for bull damage or squirrels or mole, um, in any number of critters. Um, and then of course, one I've already mentioned this one, fading foliage is ugly plan to disguise or dis distract or so put those um, bulbs that are going to have the ugly foliage in areas where you have um, bloom right after the 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 bulbs fade. Um, on selecting the healthy bulbs, you once again, I already mentioned this, but compare the local stores to online sources. One thing I like about the local sources is you can actually touch and feel the bulbs. And that way you can see if they're still fresh or they're deteriorating or they're starting um, to break down. Um, keep in mind that when you're shopping in these catalogs as well as locally, sizes will vary by variety and you want to buy the best size for the price. And um, as bulbs age from year to year to year, the bulb gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And some of these catalogs classify bulbs at different sizes. And so just because a bulb might cost you pennies on a dollar and it's like um, a couple sizes smaller, my advice is get the bigger uh, bulb, pay the more um, the, the more on the price, that way that you can have a better show in the spring. So just because they're cheap doesn't mean you're going to get a good show. So compare sizes with prices, definitely. Um, some catalogs have the statement, 
all our bulbs are blooming size. So what is a blooming size bulb? And it goes back to what I just said. You know, you can have a two-year-old, a two-year-old bulb that is relatively small. It will bloom, but the bloom is going to be inferior. But you could have a four-year-old bulb and have a much bigger and brighter, um, more quality bloom. So just keep that in mind that 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 slogan doesn't always mean much. Um, take a look at price and size of the bulb. What are you paying for? Um, keep in mind that we have the harder bulbs and then we also have fleshy bulbs. So just pay attention to when you're feeling these bulbs or you're looking in a catalog, you know, when they get, when they ship them, just make sure there's no deterioration. If they're supposed to be fleshy, you don't want it to be slimy and, and um, mushy. You still want some firmness to it, but there can be a little give. But if it's a harder bulb, like a crocus bulb, like a, um, a hyacinth bulb, you don't want it to be squishy. You want it to be nice and firm. Um, small blemishes or, or little bits coming off doesn't really matter. It's not going to hurt. Um, and little bits of mold, not a big problem. It's when they're completely dried out, if they're supposed to be fleshy or completely mushy, if they're supposed to be fleshy. And then, you know, if there's just deterioration and there's the real light, nothing's there. That's when, you know, you don't want to buy them. Um, and then I've had some bulbs that are supposed to be dried out. Um, they're more of a corm. And so just keep that in mind. Bulbs can be hard. Um, it's going back to the research and finding out what the bulbs are like before you're supposed to plant them. Uh, just to give you a rundown quickly about timing of planting of bulbs. You know, I'm, I'm talking about just buy, selecting and buying your bulbs right now. So between now and probably the third week of October, you should be ordering and storing them. And when you store them, they should be in a dry, cool place. Um, and then once we hit about the second, third week of October, start thinking about planting. Here in Southeast Missouri, we can plant into November and December. The big thing is with planting, you want the ground to be cold. You don't want to, it insulated. You want it to be cold. So Because if the ground's too warm and you plant those bulbs, they'll sprout and come on up and you do not want that. Um, you can plant some of these bulbs as late as December and January. But when we get into February, we're starting to have that countdown. Most of these bulbs need about nine weeks to 12 weeks of cold chilling time. And so when we get to February, like that first week of February, we're really starting to hurt on the number of days that you're going to get chilling. So that's why I always try to tell people, try to get them in the ground at the end of October to November. But if you forget about them, which I've done, then you can probably go as late as January and even the first week of February. If you get too far into February, they'll sprout, but they probably just won't bloom for you. Um, and then just keep in mind, you can always force them indoors. And that's a whole nother topic. We won't get into that. And if you are going to mulch your beds, um, do it once the ground has cooled down and froze. Um, and, and a lot of that, you're not going to be mulching until December, you know, maybe late, latter part of November into December, into January. And that's because once again, the cold soil will keep those bulbs from sprouting. And so putting any mulch when the soil is warm will only encourage them to come up faster. Okay, so that is the end of that topic. And so our next topic is watering trees in the fall and winter. And Debbie, that is your topic. Yeah, so I like um, this topic in particular just simply because it's something that people generally don't think about, but they really need to think about it. So fall, we, we, we always know we want to water our plants in the summer are in, in the spring when they start growing, but we don't think about it in the fall and in the winter. And it's really, really important um, that we know that. And I guess it helps if I start from the beginning, right? Okay, so um, when we think about watering, we also need to remember you know, the term drought. When we think of drought, we always think of drought as being in the summer. But droughts actually, the definition of a drought is a long period of, of time frame when there really isn't enough moisture or not enough rainfall or even snowpack, depending upon where you live. The picture that I have here, I clipped it from the US drought monitor um, here. And so what that is, is if you notice it's December 20th of 2020, 
that this particular in December, notice where all the drought was. We had a lot of it out here, but if you look at it in Missouri, the yellow part is abnormally dry. The kind of beige is moderate drought. So if you notice up in the corner and over in the other corner in December of 2020, there were conditions in Missouri where it was under drought during the winter. So we need to remember that those things when we actually are talking about our plants. The, the trees and the shrubs outside, they don't look like they're doing anything, but yet they are. So we also have to think, and we think of it as uh, the second bullet here, it's often described uh, as a creeping phenomenon, simply because we don't really notice that it's happening until it gets excessively dry. And we're like, wow, we really need to water when we really should start watering a little bit earlier before we, we notice what it is. It also is a creeping phenomenon just simply because the trees and the shrubs are doing fine now, but what happens when they are in a drought condition and don't get the water, the effects of that from not getting the water happen later. So the diseases or the insects or how our trees and shrubs look usually doesn't start appearing until the next season or even the following year after that. And so let's talk a little bit more. So the result of a long dry period during the fall can actually, and in the winter, can actually cause a lot of injury to our trees and shrubs. And mainly what it does is it affects the root system. So our roots actually are still growing. Their plants are still alive. They're just kind of in a dormant state. So we have to remember that they do need water. The plants can actually appear to look normal during the winter, but once they actually start growing back in the spring, what happens is, is that they're using the stored energy from the previous year. And all that energy is going to be used up so they're not able to, to make and produce a lot more energy because it's already being used. Their, their tanks are actually going empty. So here is a picture of some different um, evergreen shrubs. So we have to know and understand that our evergreens actually still maintain their needles or their leaves, such as like a holly bush. And so we have to remember that they are still transpiring. So they're still doing the things that they normally would do during a typical growing, what we think of as the typical growing season. So they have more surface area where they're losing water and moisture. And so what happens then is if we don't water or if they don't get enough water in the spring, they start having different signs and indications. And then we get phone calls. Oh, hey, what's happening to this particular bush or this tree, such as what's happening here? And everybody thinks it's some sort of a disease when in reality, it could be because of drought conditions that previous winter or even two winters ago. Sometimes we don't see signs and symptoms until after up to two years with our trees and our shrubs. So we need to make sure that we know that. Also, the, the trees and the shrubs be, become a little weakened because they use up all that energy. They don't get the moisture they need, and it makes them more susceptible to insects and diseases. And so kind of pay attention. We had a drought, a little bit of a drought across in some locations more so than others. I'm saying a little bit in my county, it was a little bit. Um, so pay attention to what your trees and shrubs are going to look like in the spring and the summer and even that following spring and summer could be from the drought from this year. So make sure that when there are long prolonged dry periods, we have to make sure that we get the water onto those roots. You want to water during the fall and the winter when the air and the soil temperatures are above 40 degrees. If it gets below that, then the water just has a tendency to run off the top because the soil is not going to absorb the moisture and especially if it's frozen, it's not going to go anywhere when the soil is frozen. It's best to water at midday if that's if you're working and you're not available to water during midday or on a weekend during the midday, just make sure that at least you try to get some water on those on those uh, plants simply because they need it. And they suggest midday, just simply it allows that time for that water to percolate down into the soil so that it can get there before the ground might freeze. Because we do have um, 
the freezing and thawing of our soils in the fall and going into ending into the uh, late winter, they will freeze and thaw as well. If you have large trees, the root system spreads out, doesn't necessarily go all go down, but it spreads out. It can get spread out even past the length of our drip lines of our trees. So you wanna water in an area within the, the zone, that root zone under the, within that drip line where those roots are going to be. And that's the most critical area to water. Then I believe in the past, I think it might've been Jennifer who talked about the screwdriver test. You can take a probe or a screwdriver, um, push it down into the soil. If it goes all the way down to the handle, there's probably enough moisture in that soil. Um, if you put it down in there and it's difficult, you have to take some energy and really push it into the soil, then chances are that soil is really dry and you really should be watering that soil. So that's a good test to know during the fall and in the winter. And then last but not least, remember to disconnect your hoses from the outside faucet and then drain that hose. So it may be a hassle to take those hoses in and out. Um, of your garage or your basement, wherever you store your hoses for, for the winter time. But if you really wanna take care of your plants, just remember watering them in the fall and then watering them in the winter time, if we have any kind of drought conditions is, is gonna be really important to the health of those plants ongoing. That's what I've got. Thank you, Debbie. All right, so our next um, topic is composting with Justin. Justin, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so fall is a great time to start thinking about compost. Uh, if you're not already currently composting, um, you know, we have our leaves will be coming down before too long here. Uh, right now we have, you know, our fescue lawns are growing very rapidly, but composting is really just a way that we can harness that natural power of decay. We can kind of optimize that natural power of decay to produce a really great a finished product that can be a great amendment to our soil. So some of the benefits of compost, I think we all have, as gardeners, have probably heard a lot about how great compost is for the soil. Um, so it, it can help improve and increase our soil organic matter. And, and just to give you an idea, 1% uh, increase in organic matter helps your soil hold additional almost four gallons per square yard, which Debbie was talking about drought. So, you know, we can hold on to that water for longer. It also really is a food for uh, the plethora of soil microorganisms that exist, you know, in and below the soil surface. Uh, as we increase organic matter levels, you know, that water holding capacity goes up, but also the infiltration capacity. So when that heavy rainfall comes in, that water is actually able to percolate downward. It also adds nutrients to our soil. So as we increase organic matter, every 1% will release about 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, which can supply, a, you know, a substantial portion of nitrogen needs to the crop as your organic matter levels begin growing soil tilth and friability. So, you know, in our heavy clay soils um, that don't necessarily absorb moisture very well, they can don't necessarily have great pore space for oxygen. So organic matter and compost can really help improve that soil tilth and that soil friability. So in terms of compost, there's some things that we need. Um, the decomposers, um, these are existing naturally in the environment. They're existing on the plant waste materials that we're adding to the compost pile. Um, but these microorganisms are really responsible for uh, the work done in the compost pile of converting, you know, recognizable garden materials to a, a nice finished product. So what we need to do is supply food for the decomposers. And we do that by adding different organic materials. And then we add those materials and then we, we manage the air, water and warmth of that compost pile to help keep these decomposers doing what they do best. 
So in terms of food for decomposers, you know, there's a lot of things that we can use from our landscape and our homes to uh, to feed these decomposers. So, you know, grass clippings, um, garden clean out, garden trimmings, our vegetable kitchen scraps, leaves, um, as well as potting soil, manure, sawdust, and straw. Uh, but there are some things that we should avoid. Um, so things like dairy products, things with lots of fat and grease, such as meat or fish, um, we should not be putting those in the pile. Also, some of our hard to kill weeds and seeds like Bermuda grass, nuts edge, um, oftentimes in the backyard compost pile, we're not achieving the temperatures necessary to kill these weeds and weed seeds. Um, also, you know, even sometimes some of our diseased plants, we might want to keep those out of the compost pile because we might not be getting temperatures in the backyard compost pile that are high enough um, to kill some of those diseases. Uh, manure can be used in compost piles, but we want to avoid cat and dog manure. Um, a lot of folks want to use wood ash in the compost pile. It's okay to use some, but we don't want to do use too much because this can really raise the pH of the compost and then raise the pH of your soil as well. So we divide these materials into classifications called browns and greens. So our brown materials are, you know, by nature, generally brown in color. Um, they have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so these things are, are leaves and straw, paper, sawdust. Um, most newspaper now is treated with uh, soybean-based ink, so it is safe to use in compost piles. This could also be um, animal bedding as well. Our green materials, these are materials that are high in nitrogen. And so we think about things like um, kitchen vegetable scraps, um, coffee grounds, grass clippings are a great source of green materials that a lot of folks have. Uh, important note, if you're using broadleaf weed control herbicides, it's probably not best to use those. Uh, if you're using broadleaf weed control on your lawn, it's probably not best to use those grass clippings in a compost pile. Uh, manure is a great green material that's high in nitrogen. I put an asterisk by there um, because there are pathogens in manure and a backyard compost pile it might not heat up high enough to kill those pathogens. So if we're using animal based or if we're using manures in a compost pile, um, it's best to go ahead and put that compost in the fall in the garden um, so that it has time for those microorganisms, uh, pathogenic microorganisms to die off before we plant in the spring. So in terms of, of building our compost pile, um, three by three feet to five by five feet is kind of ideal. If you get smaller than that, it's not really going to heat up very well. And if you get larger than that, it's, it's really hard to turn. So you can start with a layer of those browns. And we're just going to layer the brown and green materials kind of in, in equal volumes as we go up. Um, leave a little depression on the top of the pile. Um, because we, we do want that pile to maintain some moisture so that can help collect some rainfall. You can sprinkle just a little handful of soil between each layer. That'll just help supercharge uh, and inoculate that pile with some of those decomposing organisms. When we think about compost moisture, you want to have it about the texture of like a rung sponge. So we want it to be moist but not soggy. This process is an aerobic process. So there's a lot of oxygen involved and these microorganisms need a lot of oxygen to really thrive and do their job. So there's a number of different ways that, that we can turn compost, but turning compost is uh, what we need to do if we want to expedite that composting process. So for you know a quick compost pile to kind of get it from start to finish the, the quickest, we wanna turn it every five to seven days. You know, maintain that moisture. You might need to dry, uh, pardon me, add some water if it gets dried out. Um, during those first couple of weeks of turning, that temperature will elevate. And then after about four weeks, uh, there will be generally less heat produced from that compost pile. So four weeks, it's going to be hot. And then turn in for another four weeks, those temperatures will start declining. And then we want to let that pile cure for about four more weeks. So we're looking at a three-month start to finish process. Um, you don't necessarily have to turn it every five uh, to seven days, but the less you turn, the more time it's going to take to get a finished product. And so when we're talking about finished compost, it should be dark and crumbly. It should have an earthy smell. The initial materials you started with should be unrecognizable. But in terms of how to use it, 
Um, we want to top dress about two to three inches annually on the soil. We don't want to necessarily add four to six inches or a foot of compost at one time because that can um, cause some imbalances in your soil chemistry. Uh, can also be used as a lawn, uh, lawn top dressing. We want to use a finer compost or a screen compost for that. And it's best to do after core aeration, getting about a quarter inch layer down. And that can over time help build up soil organic matter um, and also, you know, kind of supercharge your, your lawn soil with some of the microorganisms. It can also be a great uh, amendment to potting mix. Um, you want to use the finer compost for that. And you want to mix no more than about a third of that compost by volume with, with your potting mix. And that's the short and skinny uh, on compost. Okay, thank you, Justin. This has been great today, all this good content, uh, lots of information. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Debbie, and she's going to talk a little bit, bit about um, a couple of websites. Uh, I believe Justin was going to do that. Oh, okay. Sorry, Justin. Justin's going to do that. I assume Justin was, or you. I'm sorry, I don't have that site up. I can pull it up if I need to, though. If you don't mind, Debbie, I'm having some issues with my screen duplicating, and I can't um, get it pulled up on my second screen. Sure, not a problem. I I just pulled it up. So um, Eli is going to drop into the chat box um, this information. And essentially what we want to want you to know is that on our extension website, we have lots of different events that are happening, whether it's face-to-face -face or it could be via Zoom. And they're all listed on our extension.missouri. That edu is our official website, but if you click on um, events here, so anything that's going to be upcoming, and it will go to that page, and then if you look over on the left side, we have a couple of different areas in those gray boxes, and then you can click on find your interest, click on agriculture and environment. And then it should repopulate this page that's going to have anything to do with agriculture events that are coming up. And there's lots of things that we're actually doing across the state, but there are some that might be of interest to you. So we know one of our colleagues, Druba, is gonna be doing a garlic production workshop. It's for both gardeners and those that are thinking they might wanna grow it in a little bit more, uh, more bases where they might wanna sell something cover crops and vets for the vegetable garden. I believe Justin's the one who's doing that via Zoom. This one's face-to-face, -face, specifically in Blue Springs on composting, making it easy. Um, here's one for, for sales, a master gardener, um, field day, composting workshop. I think that's also gonna be Justin uh, doing this face-to-face uh, face -face up in Bowling Green, if you're near that part. Um, and you can see how many different pages we have. I'm going to the next page because um, I know there's something else that's on this one, I believe. Another composting workshop and uh, Justin's going to do that one via Zoom. So lots of extension garden steward that's via Zoom. Tamara is going to be doing that one. It's five sessions and you can click on this to read more. Click on the link up here just to find out what some of these different things are that are happening. And again, it's interspersed with all of our other agriculture types of, of programs that are upcoming, or if you're interested in chainsaw safety on the farm, for example, or chainsaw safety in general. Lots of great information on our website for upcoming events. So again, it's extension.missouri.edu. Click on the tab that says events. And then when it populates that, then you can go ahead and on the left side, there's one, two, three boxes and just click on agriculture and event and it'll come up with the things that uh, will hopefully be of interest to you when it comes to our gardening. Go ahead, Justin, you can close this out. All right. Just one second. Oh, here we go. All right, so I know we drop a lot of great material in the chat box, and if you want to save that, you can hover over these three dots, and an option will come uh, to save that chat box, so you can always refer back to those links as needed. 
We also want to let you know that we do have um, live streaming of this event on YouTube, and then we also have the full garden hour available for viewing. We also kind of take some highlights from each one of those and convert them into to snippets, but a ton of videos on our YouTube channel um, with the MU integrated pest management channel. So everything from home horticulture to agriculture and livestock, commercial horticulture. So definitely check that out and let people know that, that that's out there. Uh, just want to let folks know we're going to be running weekly um, through September, and then we're going to go ahead and convert to uh, the third Wednesday of every month. I apologize that the slide should have it on there. So starting in October, the third Wednesday of the month throughout the winter season, we'll be going monthly, uh, but we definitely still would love to have you to continue to join us and uh, get this great information that we're able to share with folks across the state. And in terms of submitting questions, um, we really love having your questions. And we also love having your photos. Um, so you can do that at this website here, uh, put all your information in, um, you know, as detailed information as you can get on that question box. And uh, the pictures are always super helpful and we, we love sharing those. And once again, um, our horticulture coverage map here, we have horticulturists across the state uh, serving Missourians. So, we're always here as a resource for you. Happy to help or answer any of your questions. And if we if we don't know the answer, um, we will get the best science-based answer for you to answer that question. And I appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. And I hope you get to enjoy this really beautiful, cool weather that we have coming in the weeks ahead. And um, you know, continue harvesting and getting that garden tidied up. And we look forward to seeing you at the uh, next MU Extension Garden Hour.